Hello, and thank you for watching this brief ag forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. I want to take just a moment and kind of reflect back on the events that happened on the 30th of December in Colorado. You're looking here at the wind field on that day, and we had a strong downslope wind coming off the Rocky Mountains here with relative humidity values that were down into the single digits. We saw winds that were between 60 and 115 miles an hour. And as that fire started and spread, you can see it from satellite, we uh, saw that the spread rate of this fire at times was up to 0.2 acres per second, which meant on those strong winds, it very quickly spread uh, to the east across this area. Now that's an area that's been very, very dry actually since about the end of July until now. Some places in and around the Denver area measured less than um, a quarter of an inch of total rainfall since the end of July. Very, very dry in this area. And plus, no snow until the very end of, of the month of December either. If we just look back at December, we can see here our precipitation ranks by climate district. And overall on this map, we see that much of the southern plains getting into the high plains into this area was uh, was dry. It was actually well forecast to be dry, while the upper Midwest, the northern plains, and much of the west was uh, very, very wet compared to average. We did have a big winter storm that went through the mid-Atlantic today, which helped uh, alleviate some of the, the drought issues that are ongoing here in the mid-Atlantic, uh, but a lot more precipitation is needed in this area to kind of cure this longer-term drought. I'm going to come back to this map in just a few seconds, but first, let's get a bigger picture of this. Uh, this is the January 3rd 16 inch or 40 centimeter soil moisture values. And again, my long standing concern for this winter is the development of the drought here in the plains and it extending north into the Corn Belt. And yes, we did see snow in this area. In fact, take a look. After that big fire event, we did put a coating of snow down here and a system that went through parts of the Midwest into the upper Midwest, dragging with it a swath of snow. But remember, there's not much liquid water in snow. So even as this tries to melt here, we're not putting much soil uh, moisture back into the soil. So that area continues to stay dry and is of great concern to us. Now, just thinking about all of this, how well did the weather forecast models predict this? Uh, and I can show you. Back on December the 2nd, this was released. This was the forecast for the month of December. And to be honest, it did a very, very good job throughout much of the country picking up on, for example, the dryness in through here. The active Ohio River Valley storm track. Remember, we had that big system on December the 10th in this area. The dryness in the southeast to the, the mid-Atlantic. Also, the clippers that had rolled through here along the northern uh, U.S. border. Maybe an area where it didn't do so great was in the Sierra Nevada because many of the reporting stations in the Sierra Nevada have already surpassed the, the total precipitation totals we saw in 2019 into 2020 and then again in 2021, uh, excuse me, 2020 into 2021. So very, very wet here. And this was the reason why. This was our December weather pattern. Big ridge sitting over the Aleutian Islands forced a broad trough to develop in Western North America. And despite not having a subtropical part of the jet stream, the flow just dipped far enough south to hit the Sierra Nevada, the Cascades, and Northern Rockies. And it was all anchored around a deeper trough here that kept the Canadian prairie so cold. When this ridge that was over the uh, kind of the mid south moved over the mid Atlantic out into the uh, open Atlantic, that's when we opened the moisture up for the December 10th event and again the December 15th severe weather event. So the position of that ridge was critical. And we're going to come back to a discussion about that in terms of temperatures here in a few moments. But where we are right now with all of this, we have one system that just exited this evening in the east. It brought a lot of cold air all the way down to the Gulf Coast. In fact, you can see the cloud streets setting up on that cold air. There was snow on the back side of this that stretched into parts of Virginia, West Virginia, up to Delaware and southern parts of New Jersey. We'll see what those snowfall totals are tomorrow. But you can still see as I kind of rock back and forth throughout the day, the snow that was in here in parts of the Midwest and Central Plains, it did kind of melt a little bit, as you can see there throughout the day. But our next big system's coming into the West, and that one's packing a punch. Before I get to it, though, I would like to show you that the West has seen substantial changes in the drought situation over the last three months. And many places here are seeing a one, two, even up to a three class improvement, while parts of the high plains and southern plains have continued to show this drier streak. And we're going to see that continuing here in the next week or so. We want to know, is that going to be in the longer term forecast as well? And how about over here in the mid-Atlantic? Will we start to improve this too? To get to those answers, i got to show you what's going on with these ocean temperatures. Because as we discussed at the end of December, we expected the La Nina, which had given us such strong trade winds, for them to start to fade. And this region over here, Nina Region 4, has already started to see a warm up in the ocean temperatures. That's giving us what we call an east-focused La Nina. In other words, the coldest water is kind of tucking itself back here, especially in a region what we call 1 plus 2. 
Combine that with the colder water that's in the Gulf of Alaska, and we're going to put together a forecast here of what we hope to see in the next few weeks. Now, when we think about all of this, we want to remember that when we have an east-focused La Nina in January, we tend to get an active storm track here and quite a bit of cold air and snow coming into the northern plains out of the Canadian prairie. It tends to be drier in the southern plains along the Gulf Coast and drier in Southern California. Now, why this is so important is because the jet stream pattern we need to see return is a big ridge here. Now this is what could alter all of this. If that large ridge comes back, as it is forecast to fade over the next seven days, we could get that flow dipping once again farther to the south, resulting in wetter conditions for California. An active jet stream pattern that pulls into the Midwest. That could improve central plains precipitation, but it will more than likely be mild from Texas over to South Carolina on this overall pattern. This is what happens in January when La Nina dominates. Now the models, in my opinion, have fully bid into this. In other words, I think that what they're seeing with this La Nina pulling back over here towards South America, having its strongest component, plus the cold water here, is why the models are giving us this long range forecast for precipitation. This would be uh, January 15th through February 15th. And again, you see where it's active. Here and in through here. That is you know, kind of a textbook Nino 1 plus 2 strengthening La Nina here in January. All right, it's fading in the Central Pacific, but maintaining its strength elsewhere. The temperature forecast, I hate to say it, is probably going to be garbage. And the reason why is I believe that the high amplitude flow in the Pacific jet stream is going to give us a highly volatile temperature pattern. We saw it today, right? Big cold front sweeps all the way through the country, knocking temperatures back. Immediately behind it in the plains, the temperatures were 40 degrees warmer than they were on Sunday. That kind of temperature fluctuation will be common. But if there's cold air, the models are saying keep it here and keep it in the west. Mild around the ridging that'll set up between Texas and South Carolina. Now from there, given that that's our new long range outlook, let's take a look at the near term here. Let me shrink this up so we can see it. And let's now talk about our multi-model analysis. The big coastal system here, it's already offshore by this evening and getting into Tuesday morning, it's now going to turn our attention back over to the west. Both models bringing in potent onshore flow, coastal flooding, big snows in the mountains. I'll show you in a few moments. And we're going to have a little clipper that ejects Tuesday midday and strengthens into early Wednesday morning over the Great Lakes. Both models got that pinned down. Very strong winds, blowing snow on the back side of this, and a powerful front swipes through here into the parts of the Midwest. The models agree on all of this, but they start to disagree as I get into Thursday morning. Now watch this. I want you to focus on the European first. The European model is going to drop a wave, a short wave, right here into the Mid-South, have it pull through Tennessee and Kentucky, run up through the Appalachian Mountains, still bring a lot of snow, and keep snowing here into New England. The GFS is going to do almost, not the opposite, but just that same pattern with just no kind of potency to it. Watch. Ready? Keep your eye over here. This is now overnight, oops, Thursday morning, Thursday midday, Thursday evening. Did you see it? The low forms there, pulls in the moisture, and it goes. Eastern Kentucky, Eastern Tennessee, getting into Virginia, West Virginia, really the western side of Virginia too. The snow comes through Friday morning. Friday midday and Friday evening, and it pulls through as a powerful nor'easter. Now, come back over here. Let me take you back to Thursday morning. There's that system. The European says, do that. You know what the GFS does? Is it starves it for moisture, keeps the pressure too high, no strong gradient through Friday, the system goes offshore, and we get nothing in through here. What a complete difference in the models just by the end of this week. And then what's a bit baffling is they all come back together with the next system in the, west, in the northwest. See it here? This is now Friday at 6 p.m. That comes through. They both eject a wave that comes out here in northern Minnesota, draws in moisture from the Gulf around this high pressure cell. It's in both models. Opens up a corridor of showers and storms in through here. This is now Saturday noon, Saturday evening, getting into Sunday. Very consistent messaging at the end of the week and at the beginning of this week, but the middle week system completely different. And it means differences in the snowfall totals. Take a look. This is the European model next seven days. We got the clipper coming through. We have the first system that's already left, but the system that comes out right here, look at the snow the European model puts down in this area. 
there's a big swath in there two to six inches and then it carries it into New England so this is the European this is the GFS not there see that but it's got the clippers and boy does the West get pounded take a look at this operational European run today zero or 12z run five to seven feet of snow in the Cascades 20 to 30 inches in the northern Rockies central Rockies and down here toward Colorado it's drier south but these next several systems coming to the west are packing in a lot of snow. Now, in the Columbia Basin, be careful with these snowfall amounts. The Blue Mountains are here, but in the Columbia Basin, be careful because the model can't handle the elevation very well. We know that that's a problem. But this is how things shape up as we get out here uh, over the next week in terms of snow. One last graphic for this next week. It's total accumulated precip liquid equivalent. I want to point out the drier regions. California through the four corner states, the southern plains, and this swath right in through here seems to stay drier in the models. So we're going to watch out for that carefully. By week two, the models keep that deeper trough in place here. But look at this flow. What do you get out of that? This splits over the west with a bigger ridge. Convergence in the flow here leads to drier conditions, which means all the action is going to be offshore. So we look out there at week two, and we see drier in the west, drier here in the east. It's really centered on the Tennessee and Ohio Valley. But I don't think that's going to last long. The reason why? As we let this stretch out toward the 16th, 17th, and 18th, the models hint at rebuilding a ridge here, bringing the better flow into the west, and bringing that trough a little bit closer here to the eastern side of the United States, which means a more active pattern in through this area. So this is mainly going to be up to about mid-month. Temperature-wise, December was very hot throughout the plains, the southern plains, especially into the Midwest and over toward the east coast and the southeast. Places where we had the cold air, that's where it's coming back right now. Take a look at these temperatures. This was Monday's temperatures, but already by Tuesday, the next bit of cold air advances. The downslope flow here in the midsection of the country, keeping it very warm compared to average. But look at that cold snap coming through on Wednesday. That's wrapping around the deeper low that's here. And remember, on Thursday, the next low starts here and pulls over toward the Tennessee Valley, and it's got cold air behind it as well. So that's Friday's high temperatures compared to average. Getting into the weekend, we rebound again here. But the northern plains set up again with another shot at cold air by Sunday. Our long-term forecast for temperature is not going to be accurate. Even the ensembles are going to miss out on this pattern because it's highly volatile at this stage. But you can see the temperature separation here across North America. That's day 5 through 10, and this is day 10 through 15. Will it be this mild in the Canadian prairie in the central plains of the United States? That's all dependent on the placement of the ridge. Will it be over the Aleutian Islands or closer to the west coast of North America? One thing I can say is the polar vortex right now, even though it did elongate as we'd predicted, it did not become disrupted. And the models are forecasting it to strengthen over time, not weaken. This is average. It's forecast be way up here. And the result is, 10 days from now, it's going to sit right over the Arctic, very strong. And as a consequence of that, we don't expect a polar vortex, dex, excuse me, polar vortex disruption through mid-January. I'll watch all of this, get back my normal cadence of videos here, give you another update on Thursday. Have a good one. Thanks.